Anyone here ever find it difficult to give thanks? I mean, you're just going through a difficult period of life, a difficult season. You're just having one of those days, one of those years. Or maybe you grew up in just one of those families, or you grew up in just one of those neighborhoods. And as you reflect on your life, as you reflect on your day, your family, your circumstances, your situations, you just find yourself at this place where you find nothing coming out as far as Thanksgiving is concerned. Well, if you do, just like Michael Jackson said, you are not alone, okay, this morning. You are not alone. You guys want me to sing it? I won't. In Luke chapter 17, just real quick, there were nine lepers who struggled with the same thing. They struggled with making their way back to Jesus and saying thank you. Let me read to you guys real quick out of Luke chapter 17, verses 12 through 17. It says, Then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers, who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourself to the priests. And so it was that they went and they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God. Verse 16, fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. It says, so Jesus answered and said, were there not ten who were cleansed? But where are the nine or in other words, where did the nine go? Jesus says, you know what? I, I, I thought there were ten. Ten were healed. One came back. Ten were restored. Only one said thank you. Ten were touched. Only one acted as if he was. Jesus said, where are the nine? Where did they go? I believe that a daily struggle of ours is to not live our lives among the nine or among the 90%. You see, we are truly blessed, and yet one of the things that is so difficult within the midst of our lives and our days is to find this place of contentment where we can honestly look to the Lord and say, you know what, thank you. And the question you know, comes up, well, why was there only one leper that returned to Jesus and said, thank you? I love what someone wrote. He, they suggested five reasons why um, these lepers did not return. Somebody wrote, one could have possibly said, I'm not going. I, one of them possibly could have said, I'm going to wait and see if the cure was real. I hope I wasn't tricked. One could have possibly waited to see if it would last. I'm not going to say thank you, and yet watch it wear off. One could have possibly said he would see Jesus later and get back to him or thank him later on. One could have said, you know what? You know, I, I, maybe I never had leprosy. If it was so easy for him to get rid of it, then maybe I never had it. So why say thank you? One could have gotten to the point where they've gotten you know, this thought in their mind, well, I would have gotten better anyway. He just rushed the process. So healing or no healing, eventually I would have gotten him better. So why say thank you? You see, there's a whole lot of reasons why someone doesn't say thank you to the Lord. There's a whole bunch of reasons why a child wouldn't go and say thank you to a parent. There's so many reasons why a student won't go, wouldn't go and say thank you to a teacher. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why a congregation would never go and say thank you to a pastor. But anyway, we won't get into that one this morning. I'm just kidding. But there's a whole bunch of reasons why at one time or another, it is so difficult for all of us to make our way and to say thank you. Or we forget to say thank you. Or we refuse to say thank you. This morning, I want to teach you guys through the Word of God two things, or literally two ingredients for Thanksgiving here out of Colossians chapter 3. As you guys know, Thursday's Thanksgiving, and Thursday is the day where people like to show off their recipes, isn't it? 
I mean, this is that time of the year where you're just like, man, it is time to bust out the secret ingredients. You know, grandma goes into her kitchen and, and some of you are like, man, I can't wait because she only does this once a year. And some of you are trying to peek and some of you are trying to snoop. Some of you are trying to get a hold of that recipe because we want to find out what's the secret ingredient. What does grandma put in the potato salad that makes it so good? How does my green bean casserole not turn out like hers? You know what I mean? Or whatever. Why is my turkey so dry and hers is so what? Juicy. I mean, you're like, what is the secret ingredient? And this morning, in the same way that there's a secret ingredient or ingredients to our family Thanksgiving, there are also ingredients to Thanksgiving when it comes to the Lord. And I believe Colossians chapter 3 gives us insight into two of them. So let's begin reading this morning in verse 15. It says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you were also called in one body, and be thankful. If you guys are taking notes this morning, the first ingredient, the first thing that we want to focus on that I believe is important or results in thanksgiving, number one, is the peace of Christ. It says there in verse, in verse 15, number one, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Obviously, your hearts. When the Bible refers to our heart, it refers to the center of all of our conflicts. It refers to our fears. It refers to our hopes. It refers to our distress, our distrust, our trust, our jealousy, our love, everything that involves you, everything that makes up you involves the heart. In Proverbs chapter 4, the Bible says that we are to guard our heart because out of it comes all the issues of life. And so everything that entails your life, everything that consumes you, everything that makes up you and me, first happens within the heart. And so he says, would you let the peace of Christ rule in your heart? Let me give you a word this morning to write down the word rule there in verse 15 in the Greek. It literally means to umpire. So it says, let the peace of Christ umpire your heart. What does an umpire do? He makes the calls. He makes the calls. He knows the rules. The peace of God knows the word of God. And he says, would you let God's peace umpire your heart? Would you let him call the shots? Would you let him make the calls when it comes to your heart? You see, an umpire takes the information that's available to them. And based on that information, what do they do? They make a call. They decide a course. They decide which action is going to be followed. So in the same way, he says, the peace of God is to umpire our lives. The peace of God is supposed to control me, in a sense. It consumes me. It takes over. And so when it comes to decisions in my life, the peace of God rules. It umpires. When it comes to things that are going on that are causing my mind to panic, All of a sudden, the peace of God jumps in, takes the information, everything based on life, and says, hey, God is still good. Would you trust him? And so he says, hey, would you let the peace of God umpire your heart? In John chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus said these words to his disciples, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, Neither let it be afraid. In context here in John chapter 14, Jesus had just told his disciples that he was going to go away. You guys remember Jesus is heading to the cross and Jesus drops this bombshell on his disciples and says, I'm going to go, but I'm going to leave you a helper, the Holy Spirit. And so all of a sudden, the result of what's taking place here is Jesus is saying, hey, peace I leave with you. Literally the Holy Spirit I'm going to leave with you. And the Holy Spirit is going to 
work in your life. The Holy Spirit is going to give you what you need. And one of the things I want us to stop for a second this morning and reflect on are the two types of peace that's available to us. You see, worldly peace is usually defined as the absence of conflict. Worldly peace is the absence of conflict. And so what is our world searching for? It's searching for worldly peace, is it not? It's looking for some sort of, hey, can we just go over grandma's house this Thursday and everyone not fight? Can there just simply be some peace? Can someone not get stomped out at the end of the night? You know, can, 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 can you guys just not get drunk tonight so that everything could be what? Smooth. We just simply want the absence of conflict. When you think of big picture in the world, we think, okay, the only way to stop the war or to stop terrorism or to stop country versus country, group versus group, is the absence of conflict. If we can just get everyone to put down their guns, then we have peace. We don't have peace. Why? Because peace goes a step further. Peace is coming to know the Lord. And so we look and say, oh man, if people would just drop their guns, we would have peace. We'd have conflict. No, because you still have sin. You still got people, guns are down, but they still need Jesus. And so worldly peace says, hey, if we could just get rid of the conflict, I think everything will be okay. But listen to biblical peace. Biblical peace says this. Biblical peace is the presence of God. Biblical peace says, okay, God is here. Things are going crazy. I'm watching things on the news. You know, I'm watching all this take place. I just got another crazy medical bill out of nowhere, you know? It's just, and you guys know what that's like, right? You get those ER bills out of nowhere, and you're just like, oh. And yet the presence of God is there. Doesn't get rid of the bill. Doesn't necessarily, everyone's saved now. But he says, man, I'm present in your life. Could you rest? Can you find peace within that moment? And so the world searches for peace, but it finds none apart from Jesus. Because we know that the only place that peace is found is getting to that place, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, where Christ is preeminent in our life, where Jesus is first, where Jesus is ahead of all things. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7 said, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And so literally says, hey, Philippian church, would you worry about nothing? Would you allow your heart instead to pray about everything? So he says, worry about nothing, pray about everything. He says, would you tell God what you need? Would you make your requests known to him? And would you thank him for all he's done? And when you do that, will you, will you step back and watch the peace of God all of a sudden transform your heart? It might not transform the situation, but it'll transform your heart. It might not make the circumstances go away, but it'll make the circumstance of your heart be able to trust in Him. Imagine being at a place where you could be anxious for nothing. I mean, think about our day. Think about the things that come in the midst of our week. Imagine reaching a place where Paul is writing here and saying, would you be anxious for nothing? Nothing. Being at the same place where in Acts chapter 20, you guys remember Paul says, yet none of these things move me. I know that I'm bound for chains. I know that I'm, death is imminent. Yet none of these things move me. I'm anxious for nothing. This is my encouragement to you guys this morning. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. It says, you will keep him, her, in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he or she trusts in you. 
One of the things, would you give me a for a minute, church? One of the things that I think is so important for us this morning, if we're going to look at the ingredients for Thanksgiving, and some of us might be looking and saying, man, my heart isn't turning out like theirs. Just like your cake doesn't turn out like theirs. Just like your turkey doesn't turn out like theirs. And you're like, what's missing? He says, peace. You're like, man, my heart isn't turning out like theirs as far as the new man in Christ. As far as Thanksgiving's concerned. And God's like, you missed something. You haven't been letting the peace of God umpire rule your heart. So it says there in Isaiah, let your mind be stayed on him. Keep it stayed on the Lord. And this morning, if we can reach the place, if we can get to that, to that moment where before the Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can look at the Lord and say, man, my mind is stayed on you. My mind is not stayed on situation. My mind is not stayed on circumstance. My mind is not stayed on conflict. My mind is not stayed on bills. My mind is not stayed on my anxiety. My mind is not stayed on the things that are heavy upon my heart. My mind is stayed on you. And the Bible says, oh, I'll give you perfect peace. I'll give you exactly what you need if you trust me. So number one, first ingredient he says, would you let the peace of Christ rule in your heart? Would you look at the end of verse 15 with me? Why is peace so important in our life? Look at the end of verse 15. It says, and be thankful. And so I believe the end result of peace is thanksgiving. And so Paul just wrote, hey, would you let the peace of God rule? Oh, and by the way, now that the peace of God's rolling in your heart, you now have the ability to be thankful. Because peace is ruling your heart, you now are at a place spiritually that you can be thankful. He says, now that the peace of God is ruling you and your mind is stayed on him, the peace of God is now overflowing your life. And now what is what's coming out of your life? Thanksgiving. And so number one, first in green, he says, let the peace of God rule your heart. Number two this morning, would you keep reading with me, verse 16? It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Number two, if you're taking notes this morning, second ingredient is to let the word of Christ dwell in you. Number two this morning, would you let the word of Christ dwell in you? The word dwell here, it literally means, if you're taking notes in the Greek, to be at home in, to make a home. It literally means to be given charge over the house. And so he says, hey, would you let God's word come in and take residency in your life, in your heart this morning? And so all of a sudden, what does that look like? It means that God's word, because it's dwelling in me, it now is the resident of my heart, it goes and it has say in my situations. The word of God now has say in my decisions. The word of God now has say in what I believe and in my values. The word of God now has say in how I'm going to conduct myself and present my attitude. When the word of God is dwelling in me, all of a sudden, guess what it does? It affects everything in my life. Everything is now sifted through the word. Now, let's stop there for a second. Does that describe our life? Is there a part that we're holding on to? Is there a decision-making process outside of the word of God in my life? Is there something that I'm allowing to dwell in my heart that's controlling my life rather than the Word of God? Because at this point, if the Word of God is dwelling in my heart, then I am literally going to be at a place where everything is sifted, where everything is funneled through the Word of God. And so there isn't 75%, you know what, I live according to God, and yet 25%, I have my own opinion. I talk to a lot of Christians like that. 
I talk to a lot of Christians where it's just, you know what? I allow God's word to control my life. But yet I hold on to a couple of my own traditions, my own opinions. You know, a couple of things of, of how my culture does things. Some of us come from a very strong culture. You know, when I was at South Bay, I had a very strong um, Samoan group in our, in, our, um, in our group. And I remember there was one time something was going on with one of the boys. And the dad got involved. He's a man of God. And I remember he told me, Pastor, 90% of my life, I do what the Bible says. He says, but when it comes to disciplining my son, we have things, or there's a way that we do things in our culture. And I mean, and you can have the biggest, tallest, buffest Samoan kid walking around, and yet when mom comes and gives him that look, he's like, he's just jumping, you know? Dad comes around, he just walks in like this, and all of a sudden, Samoan big old kids, I'm not talking about six foot five kids, they're, 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 they're jumping, because there's a way that we do things in our culture. And I think some of us, we hold on to those things, don't we? Especially some of us are, that are Hispanic, there's things that we do, right? There's certain pride that we take in how our culture does things. And yet the moment we give our lives to the Lord, all of a sudden, culture is out the door and Christ is in the door. The moment we give our lives to the Lord, it's like how we used to do things when I was little is out the door and the, word, the way the word of God calls me to do things is now in through the front door. And so he says, would you let the word of Christ dwell in you? Would you allow it to make your decisions? Go with me over to Psalm 119 real quick. I just want to show you guys some of the benefits of the word of God. Does the word of God really matter? Psalm 119. You guys know the text. Some of you are terrified that we're going there because you're like, uh, now we're going to be at church till 3 o'clock this afternoon, but don't worry, we won't go through the whole thing. Read verse 1 with me. It says, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of God. Another word for blessed is what? Happy. So look at that. The word of God brings what? True happiness. Go with me over to verse 7. It says in verse 7, I will praise you with uprightness of heart when I learn your righteous judgment. He says, I will praise you when I learn your word. So what does the word of God bring? It brings about praise. Jump with me over to verse 9. It says, how can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. Verse 9, what does the word of God do? It keeps a person pure. You guys get the hang of this game, right? Look at verse 11. It says, your word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. So verse 11, the word keeps a person from sin. Go with me over to verse 24. I think this one's important for us. It says, your testimonies are also, also are my delight and my counselors. And so you're debating over something, trying to figure out a situation in need of some counsel. Verse 24, the word of God is my what? Counsel. The word of God is my counselor. Look at verse 28 with me. It says in verse 28, my soul melts from heaviness. Strengthen me according to your word. And so verse 28, the word brings strength. Go with me over to verse 36 and 37. We're almost done. It says in verse 36, incline my heart to your testimonies and not to covetousness, turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. And so verse 36 and 37, the word of God keeps me from being caught up in worthless things. Another word for worthless there is vain. The word of God keeps me focused on what really matters. And it stops my pursuit of the vain of the worthless. And I think all of us here know what it's like to be at a place where we are chasing after the vain, where we're chasing after the worthless. And we are in pursuit. And this is our aim. And this is what we're striving for. And then all of a sudden, the word of God comes in. 
you open your Bible in the morning. You're on your way to work and you're listening to a Bible study. You make your way to church. And all of a sudden, God begins to minister and speak to your heart. And you realize, I'm chasing the vain. I'm chasing the worthless. And what does the word of God do? What what does it do? It stops you. It settles you back where he needs you to be. One more, verse 47. He says, "And and I delight myself in your commands. I delight myself in your commands, which I love. And so, verse 47, I pray that the end result of the word of God dwelling in you is that we are able to say, give me your eyes for a minute, church, I love the word of God. You see, that's my prayer for all of us here this morning. You want to get to a place where you're like, man, I want my heart at a place of thanksgiving. Learn to love the word of God. Learn to love instruction. Learn to love counsel. Learn to love correction. Learn to love reproof. Learn to love rebuke. Learn to love the word of God this morning. To have it dwell in us richly. And then all of a sudden, you're going to notice, man, something different is flowing out of me. It's Thanksgiving. Let's go back to Colossians chapter 3. There's a difference between a guest and someone who dwells in a home. In fact, let me just ask the question, how many of you guys have ever had a guest stay too long and try to dwell in your home? I, I mean, you know what the difference is, right? Anybody ever have someone come into your home? It started out as a guest, started out as a week, a month at the most. Five years later, they're still there. Now there are pictures on the wall. <laughs> and you're sitting there, and you're like, um, yeah, you are no longer a guest. You dwell here. That wasn't the intention, by the way, but it just happened. You see, a guest is not a permanent resident. A dweller is a permanent resident. A guest comes and goes according to what is convenient for them and their host. A dweller remains regardless of their circumstances. A guest cannot make changes in a home. A dweller has the right to make changes. About three years ago, it was next weekend. Next weekend is our anniversary, by the way, 13 years. And, no, no, no. Stop, stop. Don't clap. Okay, listen. No, the reason I tell you guys that is because when we first started the church, we were homeless church for a little while. It, things didn't work out at this one place we were meeting, and so we had to take a step back from meeting in public, and we went from one service. I, it was the only time we, our church ever exploded with growth. We were meeting at a yoga studio that we didn't know was a, bo, uh, a Buddhist yoga studio. So every Sunday, we'd have to show up and cover shrines with, with claws before service. And then the, I, I think the, the thing that just was too much for us was one Sunday morning. How many of you guys were at that yoga studio? Some of you guys were there, right? And one of the Sunday mornings in the middle of my study, a monk walks in. There was a little room in the back, and I guess he had rented out. We rented that room. He would rented another room, and he was going to go do, on Sunday mornings, he would do his monk counseling. I don't know what they counsel on, but whatever it is. And so in the middle of my teaching, you'd have people walking in looking for the monk, you know, I'm here for my monk council. You know, I have an appointment with the monk. And I'm like, and it was just the weirdest thing. And so we're like, we got to get out of here. And we had nowhere to meet. This was before we were at the school. And so for about three months, I, I just felt like, okay, we got the monk people walking by. We're covering shrines on Sunday morning while we're trying to sing to Jesus. This is just not a good place of worship. We have nowhere to go. So we went, for, so we went and we started having service in my living room. Well, that year for anniversary, I took that Sunday morning off and I went away. And I made the mistake of giving Leo the keys to my house. So we go, we, everybody has church on Sunday, me and Kristen are gone. We come back from our little mini vacation and Leo decided to change all the furniture in our house. He, he thought it'd be funny. 
And so we walk in, and the couch is like on a different side of the room. The TV's in a different place. I mean, kitchen table, you know. I don't even remember what happened. It was like mattresses on the floor. and living. I mean, whatever Leo did, we literally walked in. And I was we're like, what did this guy do? You know what I mean? And, and literally, he started making changes. And the thought came to mind, he was only a guest. <laughs> a guest doesn't make changes in the home. This ain't Leo's home. Leo don't live here. Leo don't dwell up in here. I mean, you're thinking that, and you look, and you're like, there's a difference between a guest and a dweller. And so I call Leo on the phone, and all I hear on the other line is just laughing. <laughs> and I'm like, ha, ha, ha. I have to put it back all by myself. Ha, ha, ha. You know, but it was one of those things where you're just like, man, there's a difference between the two. And so let's say the Word of God is a dweller in our lives. That means the one who dwells has the right to make changes, don't they? If you live in the home, you have the right to go and say, hey, let's move this. Let's try this. Let's put this over here. Let's get this out of the house. And so if the word of God is dwelling in our heart, the word of God has the right to make changes in our life. And I think that's the difference for some of us. The Word of God is a yes that we hear and listen to. But I think even in the church, so few get to the place where the Word of God is now a dweller in their hearts. And I think for me as a pastor, that's probably my biggest prayer for us as a church. Would we go from being hearers of the Word and deceiving ourselves to being doers? where the Word of God is now dwelling and living and active in my life. And so if you've been struggling with giving thanks, please allow the Word of God to dwell in your hearts this morning. I promise, give me your eyes for a minute, church. I promise if you allow the Word of God to dwell in your hearts, there will be thanksgiving that begins to flow out of you. And I'll tell you guys, I really believe that what comes out of you is a reflection if the Word of God is dwelling in you. Go back with me over to that verse real quick. Look at what it says there, verse 16. It says, let the Word of God, or the Word of Christ, dwell in you richly. And it says, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing unto grace in our hearts to the Lord. Notice there in verse 16, he says, when, when the word of God is dwelling in you, notice what is going to be coming out of you. So what's dwelling in you affects what comes out of you. When the word of God is dwelling in you, what is coming out of you? Wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one to another. And it says, and the way that it's going to look is through psalms. Psalms. You guys remember what Psalms are? Psalms are, is that book within the Old Testament where the author of the Psalms were going through different pray, places or different things in their life and praise was coming out of them. And sometimes we use the Psalms to exhort or encourage or teach one another. It says also there's going to be hymns. Hymns in this period of time were songs that were written about Jesus. And so as the church was getting to know Jesus, they would write these hymns, these songs about Jesus. And so he says, hey, would you encourage, teach, pour into one another with songs, with truth about Jesus. And then spiritual songs would be any other sort of praise that a person would want to sing. But I think there's something important there before we get into verse 17 and finish up this morning he says this, let it dwell in you so that this is what comes out of you. Because for some of us, some of us might be saying, man, the word of God is not dwelling in me and what's coming out of me is pretty bad. What's coming out of me is not thanksgiving. What's coming out of me doesn't sound like Jesus. Jesus. And so he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you. Let's finish up verse 17 this morning. It says, and whatever you do in word or deed, 
Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. As we finish up this morning, as we head towards the finish line, would you guys real quick look at the effect on our lives that the word of God has if the word of God's making its home in our heart? There's two things, and we're going to finish here this morning, according to verse 17. If the word of God is dwelling in your hearts and the peace of God is umpiring your life, these two things are going to be taking place. Number one, there's going to be an evident, all-consuming passion to glorify God in our lives. If the peace of God and the word of God are taking control of our heart, there's going to be an all-consuming passion to glorify God in our lives. It says in verse 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord. Peace of God, word of God taken over, and all of a sudden you're like, man, it's affecting what I say and what I do. And some of us are be like, man, I've never experienced this before. This has never gone on in my heart before. But I just want to glorify the Lord. What's happening? Peace of God, word of God, taking over your life, and it's consuming you. Number two, and this is where we're done. It says there's, there's going to be an all-consuming passion to acknowledge God through thanksgiving. When the peace of God and the word of God have taken over our life, there's going to be this passion in our life to acknowledge God through thanksgiving. Let's go back and read before we pray the psalm that we began at this morning. It'll be up on the screen, Psalm 92. Verses 1 and 2 this morning. You guys can close your Bibles. We're done. It'll be up there on the screen. Let's read it together, and we'll pray. Ready to go? Let's read it. It says, It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. Back to verse 1. Read it with me one more time. It is good to give thanks to the Lord. 